you really want to have an impact, you don't put your head in the sand. That never works. You put, you know, your head to the, to the, your nose to the ground stone and you teach and you do it in a gentle way that has some humility. I'm guessing that that the ranchers you work with in Oklahoma, their hats are so big, they wouldn't be able to put their heads in the like, I'm imagining. <laughs> The New Brunswick Archaeology Podcast, featuring your hosts, Gabe Reinick and Ken Holyoke. Welcome back to the New Brunswick Archaeology Podcast. I am Gabe Reinick, and I'm here in a chilly, chilly Fredericton, New Brunswick airport. Or, sorry, let's try that again. <laughs> no, no, no. We're, we're, get, we're going to keep going. That's, uh, uh... I was going to say, I'm in a chilly New Brunswick, which is not to be confused with a New Brunswick Chili's, which is not to be confused with a Chili's. <laughs> in, in the Calgary uh, airport, Calgary which unfortunately airport. I didn't get to go to on on my most recent uh, uh, trips through the Calgary airport. So That's too bad. Do they have some kind of like a point system that you you're able to accumulate? You know what? I haven't looked into that, but I probably should. It's, you probably uh, should. You could be a member of uh, Club Chili. <laughs> the uh, so listener, you've probably gathered that I'm joined in Lethbridge, Alberta, because he's not uh, not traveling by uh, by Ken Holyoke. How are you, Ken? very best and it's it's not chilly at all here in fact it is so warm that i was just out in the yard and uh i i i'm cutting back all the herbs just because uh i didn't do it when fall actually hit uh-huh. um and, and i can report that the parsley is still growing um and is still green um wow. as is as is the sage um and and my rosemary so i've got uh my like i my my room actually smells like fresh herbs right now that's great. In the, in the gale forest winds, you can just see the parsley sort of flowing in the breeze. Exactly. Exactly. That's great. Um, so, Ken, uh, we still um, we're still the New Brunswick Archaeology Podcast, and we are still sponsored by the Association of Professional Archaeologists of New Brunswick. And uh, we have a new, uh, still fairly new to us sponsor. We're um, we've got some support from Shirk and yep, from and- University of Lethbridge. Yeah, the L- University of Lethbridge Office of Research and Innovation Services. So ULETH Oris um, and our and our our brand spanking new Shirk Exchange grant. That's great, and uh, we really appreciate um, all of our uh, all of our sponsors. Uh, so Ken, um, since we're still the New Brunswick Archaeology Podcast, um, we uh, we still have some uh, some money on the table. We we have a, a a movable feast of prizes. Sometimes it's literally a movable feast. Um, of prizes and the way this works listener is if you um, are the person to rename this podcast you will get that Fortnite's um, prize but uh, Ken where would they send that uh, winning entry to that would be to New Brunswick Archaeology at gmail.com New Brunswick Archaeology all one word archaeology spelled A-R-C-H-A-E-O-L-O-G-Y New Brunswick Archaeology at gmail.com and Ken if uh, if you open that email up is there anything in there for us uh actually we we are we are fresh out of emails right now um fresh out of emails yeah other than other than podcorn uh telling us that we've got four new sponsorship opportunities and and i don't think any of them are the are the ulath uh shirk exchange program well that's that's really fascinating um and uh so listener i mean it's not that we're lonely we just we just sort of uh you know we'd gotten used to having uh having email so um so so we'll we'll hope that 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 shows up um, fairly soon, um. But one of the things that's sure to fill up that uh, that mailbox, Ken, is um. You know what happens between September eighteenth and twenty fourth uh, this last year? I don't know the autumnal equinox. Now, let me give you a hint. Is there is there a favorite cocktail you have that's made with um, Campari gin and sweet vermouth? Oh, Negronis. Love that's them. right. We we missed Negroni week. But, oh oh, we um, did. But Ken, I don't know if you remember, there was this this um, this really not very good uh, online um, magazine uh, that published uh, a, a really an, an essay or maybe a, a sort of essay, a memoir essay called Negroni Season. Oh, it was published in the All in 2010. It was about a bad breakup um, involving, uh, I think, a boyfriend with a drinking problem who didn't celebrate Negroni Week. He celebrated Negroni Season. Oh wow! So so just to, just for the the listener to translate from down east Maine, all A W L or all A L L A W L. Thank you for consecutive Canadian <laughs> translation. Yeah, um, and and so even though we uh, always have great interpersonal relationships with everybody, and um, and and we don't have a drinking problem as, as far as I know, <laughs> um, we we like to celebrate Negroni season here at uh, the New Brunswick Archaeology Podcast, and so. 
what we're really doing is um, we're, we're launching the New Brunswick Archaeology Podcast Aperitivo Club. And oh. uh, that's right. We're, uh, we're partnering with a, with a team, a whole team of Nonas, um, to help the lucky winner get, uh, get a season of celebratory aperitivi. So you might remember that back during the pandemic, there was a rise of delivery cocktails. Um, Ken, you used to be in a, in a cocktail club, am I right? Every Friday, some cocktails would appear. That's right. We had a subscription service, actually. Yeah. Well, listener, Ken and I thought to ourselves, why should the fun stop just because people are no longer dropping dead all around us? Um, so we got ourselves a great deal on a gently used October can seamer on bre- premise beverage can uh, uh, mixer. So basically what this thing does is it's uh, you might recall you could you could get these sort of you basically can can your own cocktails. Um, that's oh. what this on premise uh, beverage can seamer does. And so what Ken and I will be doing is we're going to be hand mixing your takeout cocktails into a 12 ounce can. That's going to be tastefully decorated with New Brunswick Archaeology podcast stickers. And we're going to be uh, using that to, to get some specially prepared Amaro cocktails to your door. And then we pair with the Nonas um, to provide the food. And, um, and so what do uh, me, Ken, and the Nonas have in mind? Well, well, on Monday, uh, that's going to be we're going to start you off with a Negroni. And you remember that's gin, Campari, and sweet vermouth. And we're going to be pairing that with steak tartare and covered bridge potato chips, not to be missed. <laughs> on Tuesday, we're serving um, a cocktail called the Toronto, and that's whiskey and fernet branca, and that's going to be accompanied by a bagna cotta with sliced veggies. That's um, you, you basically cook these anchovies down in this like delicious garlic goo, and it's it's really quite scrumptious. Um, and then Wednesday, of course, will be the Black Manhattan Day. That's a uh, rye, averna, a dash of bitters, and those strong tastes are going to be accompanied by a, a caviar sour cream dip that we uh, oh, that we like wow. to do. It's quite nice, yeah. Um, Thursday, uh, that's an Aperol Spritz day. Uh, you'll remember that a, an Aperol Spritz is something a little lighter after the earlier part of the week. We're going to do Prosecco, Club Soda, um, and, uh, and of course the Aperol. And that's accompanied by a, a lovely Capri salad. And then on Friday, we help you start your weekend off right with a cocktail called the Choke and Smoke. That's a Talisker, Chinar, and Demerara syrup uh, cocktail with just a little drip of saline that really helps accentuate the flavors. And we're going to be doing that with a freshly made ricotta served on a grilled sourdough. And so we can ship these anywhere in North America. And if you're within 10 kilometers, that's 14 miles of the University of Lethbridge, Ken Holyoke. And he's got you got to do this now before he sells his large um, transport bicycle. Ken will hand deliver your drink and meal kit in his courier bicycle. And so that's right. Uh, it's uh, as Negroni's... long as the wind's not blowing. As long as yeah, the wind's yeah. not blowing. <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends on which way you're going. I mean, you could even get it there faster. That's true. Um, yeah, so um, so that's right. It's Negroni season here at the New Brunswick Archaeology Podcast, and so Ken, if um, if someone has the winning entry to uh, to to get in on this um, Negroni season, where would they uh, email that to? That would be to New Brunswick Archaeology at gmail dot com. New Brunswick Archaeology, all one word, and archaeology spelled A R C H A E O L G O L O G Y. New Brunswick Archaeology at gmail dot com. That's great, and we are launching a um. Uh, uh, some discussion now on the New Brunswick Archaeology Podcast. We want to talk about um, collaborations between professional archaeologists and a vacation archaeologists or collectors. This is a theme we've talked about um, uh, on the show before and w- with Matt, actually, most recently, Matt Betts, most recently. That's right. Um, although we actually talked about it a bit in our ESAF, uh, special ESAF episode as well. That's correct. Um, and so we're going to um, be doing this with uh, Bonnie Pitt. Pitt Plato. And with David Black, and it might be broken into a couple of different episodes. We're still figuring out how we're going to do that, but uh, we're um, we're very pleased um, about that. Yeah, yeah. And so um, we, we probably are going to do um, uh, what you're going to hear now is the interview with Bonnie. Um, and I think we'll probably do a little bit maybe of a post hoc chat with Gabe and I, um, um, or perhaps a little bit more preamble before we talk to David Black. Um but just for the listeners so they understand, um, this is essentially, um, uh, we're talking about the sort of complex relationship between um, professional archaeologists and individuals who are um, uh, members of the public, uh, sometimes called a vacational archaeologists, sometimes called collectors, um, and includes people who have private artifact collections, um, and ways that we can um, work together um, for to better understand the archaeology of particular regions and particular places, um, and find ways to um, 
encourage and educate and engage people um, who uh, lay people and people who are interested in archaeology in the past um, in ways that are are not just um, legal, which uh, which we always would encourage and um, and would uh, uh, you know that is the an expectation of it, but also uh, in ways that benefit um, not just the individuals who have collections by them learning a little bit more about it, but the archaeologists who are interested in studying those things, descendant communities, um, and the public more broadly, because uh, some of these private collections are really incredibly important and actually can tell us um, about the past in ways that uh, that we have difficulty doing now. Um, for example, uh, coastal archaeological collections, as you're familiar with. That's right. And and we should probably um, just mention right at the front, uh, Ken, because if there's one thing we try to avoid here on the New Brunswick Archaeology Podcast, it's putting the Sioux in issue. Yes. <laughs> um, is that um, it currently is uh, illegal to uh, collect uh, artifacts in New Brunswick. Correct. Uh, it's um, not the case in other jurisdictions, and it's not contrary to the SAA Archaeological Code of Ethics, as we'll discuss under all circumstances, but it is presently illegal in New Brunswick. Yeah. And, and the way that the private collections work in New Brunswick is that generally um, it is viewed that collections that were precede, that precede the enactment of the Heritage Conservation Act um, are uh, can be legally held by a private collector as long as they were collected before 2010 um, and are registered with the province. Um, but anything that is found since 2010, uh, you should contact the Provincial Archaeology Office. So that's the Heritage and Archaeology Branch. Um, and uh, we'll put maybe their uh, website in the show notes. Um, and you can reach out to them and uh, somebody from that department will reach out to you about uh, registering um, and probably accessioning your collection. Um, you can you can there's a donation process, basically, that a private collector can go through. That's right. Um, so I think, uh, Ken, I think we're going to um, have our conversation with uh, Dr. Pitt Blado. And um, through the magic of uh, time travel, there will be uh, addenda and adjustments to this, <laughs> this intro or we'll be doing a post game. We still don't know. Yeah, exactly. And uh, enjoy the enjoy the interview, listener. Yes, indeed. Okay, so we are joined now uh, with uh, Dr. Bonnie Pliblado, um, who uh, is the Robert E. and Virginia Bell Endowed Professor in Anthropological Archaeology at the University of Oklahoma Department of Anthropology. Um, Bonnie received her PhD from the University of Arizona in 1999. And her research specializes in early archaeology of the Rocky Mountains and high altitude regions of Oklahoma. She has published in American Antiquity, Antiquity, Paleo-America, Advances in Archaeological Practice, and Quaternary International, alongside books and edited volumes on early human occupation of high altitude regions. Um, many of those articles center on her interests, like your co-hosts, in public archaeology and engaging the public in archaeology. Um, she is a founding member and executive director of the Oklahoma Public Archaeology Network, which links the public and a wide network of archaeologists and educators, uh, hosts an October Archaeology Month, month, which actually just wrapped up on November 4th, with a workshop on experiments in eth ethnography, which is actually pretty cool. Um, a variety of archaeological skills, uh, ar uh, archaeological skills workshops are hosted um, and community events. Um, they also publish a newly refreshed quarterly magazine called The Community Archaeologist, um, which was formerly the Ocpan Quarterly. Um, and it's aimed at publishing educational articles from uh, from and for the public, indigenous communities, and professionals alike. Um, and and Gabe and I were both remarking on how incredibly well laid out it is. Um, uh, the the formatting and everything in the magazine is 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 very professional looking. It's it's quite nice. Um, but it's this focus on public public engagement that uh, also led Bonnie to chair uh, twenty fifteen uh, in twenty fifteen an SAA Professional Archaeologists, Avocational Archaeologists, and Responsible Artifact Collectors Relationships Task Force, um, along with uh, a number of colleagues. Um, and the result of this task force was the SAA Statement on Collaboration with Responsible and Responsive Stewards of the Past, uh, and a variety of publications since that time, among which we'd specifically like to highlight, is a collection of articles and advances in archaeological practice in 2022, about professional collector collaborations, um, edited by Dr. Pitblado Pit and her colleagues, um, called Professional Collector Collaboration, Moving Beyond Debate to Best Practice, um, which is going to be showing up in your show notes. So uh, welcome to the show, Bonnie, and thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor. 
Well, we really appreciate you um, joining us in part because uh, Ken and I have both been using your work a bunch lately. I was fortunate to uh, to spend a lot of time reading through uh, your work and and the SA Archaeologist Collector Collaboration work while devising a code of ethics or on a committee for the Eastern States Archaeology Federation, which collaborates between um, avocational and professional um, archaeologists. And so um, I'm sort of familiar with the SA Archaeologist Collector Collaboration Interest Group, but I wondered if we could start by you um, just giving us some background on that interest group and maybe defining responsible and responsive stewards, that wonderful phrase you use. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. Thank you for asking. Um, so that work was was initiated because the board of the SAA felt that this was an important issue. And so they reached out to me and asked if I would be willing to chair a task force. And it is something I've been interested in since even before I graduated with my PhD. And so I was happy to do that and, and really excited to learn through that process to really take kind of an ethnographic approach um, to see what people are really thinking out there. Because so often what we might think from our own perspective, everybody is thinking they're really not. And so that was kind of the spirit in which I began the process. It was important for, for me, I thought, to have as diverse a group of participants as possible. So I really thought carefully about the rain, the the places that were represented, the ge different geographic regions, because different different countries have different laws, and this is the SAA, so it includes all of the Western Hemisphere, and things are very different south of of the border of the United States than they are here, oftentimes. So I tried to just maximize that diversity, um, diversity in terms of the the different backgrounds of the pr practitioners, museum sector versus compliance sector demographics of all sorts so that we I really tried to balance all of that so we'd have as many voices at the table as as we could we're never going to get everybody but it was a really uh, exciting process we worked for a long time we read we started by reading really doing a deep dive into all the literature we could find and everybody kind of crowdsourced literature and then we all read it um, and then having extensive conversations and and those conversations did include by the way collectors from the that I would consider to be that we um, would consider to be responsible or responsive. And the idea here is that that our our findings from this effort of reaching out to so many people and, and encouraging participation, which is hard to, you know, a lot of times people aren't interested, but in this case, we got a ton of responses. And the vast majority of those were from archaeologists who favor collaboration when it's appropriate. And we all in our task force agreed that there is a time that it's appropriate and there's a time that it's not. There are clearly uh, a, a sector of folks out there who are the looters of the world, who are doing the collecting for personal gain. They have they do not have interests that align in any way with those of archaeologists. Um, and so those are the we were trying to figure out a way to um, agree on what makes those folks unpalatable to so many, I guess, is the word you'd want to yeah. use unethical to others, whereas so many other collectors out there, I think we think um, had a, had interests that really align with that converge with those of archaeologists. They're collecting because they feel a connection to their land. They're collecting because they feel a connection to all of the people who walked there and left items before them. And they want to to really um, honor that. They want to steward the materials carefully in many cases. And at the same time, they've had to, to really um, sort of fend off um, archaeologists who just want to lump them all together. Um, and so as a task force, we we really wrangled with that and came up with this term RRS as, as to represent those folks who do have that interest that aligns with those of archaeology and stewardship in general, and that leaves out anyone who's collecting illegally, but also who is doing it for those reasons that don't align with ours. It's such a good term. And um, and I've got a, a follow-up question actually on that, uh, Dr. Pableta, which um, I'm guessing that this interest of yours arose out of a, a personal experience working with um, a responsible or responsive steward or stewards. And I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about your history in this kind of collaborative um, framework. Absolutely. You know, it's one of those things where I, I grew up intellectually knowing no other way because I'm, as you said, I'm interested in the earliest occupation of the Western Hemisphere. And so there is so little of that material and it's so deeply buried in many cases that anybody that's ever wanted to engage with it needs to go to the, the folks that are encountering the material. That's not going to be an archaeologist like me who's walking across a landscape, just a tiny fraction of my life, right, as a professional. Yeah. And it's the ranchers and the farmers and the fishermen who are out there and are finding the material and who also so many times are, are really thinking about 
the land and land use in ways that that I couldn't as a visitor. They're the ones that are thinking about, oh, if I had to go over to this lake and I had to navigate this mountain range, how would I do it? You know, and they they're constantly thinking better than a lot of archaeologists I know about sort of archaeological matters, spatial matters. So that was it. You know, for me, there was no other way. My master's thesis and my dissertation both um, required that I engage with collecting community if I was going to have any material to work on at all, because um, everything I just said about the early record goes double for the mountains. That's a record that most people, yeah, not well known and certainly for the early time frame, not well known. So, yeah, I, I just it, it, it then came as a surprise to realize how that there was sort of the sector of, of other archaeologists out there who really thought that that was just a bad thing, that nobody, that archaeologists should never collaborate with these folks, that they can't be our allies. And so that was really what spurred my interest. And I'm sure it was the reason that the SAA reached out to me, because I'm I'm pretty vocal about that. <laughs> yeah, you, you frame it um, actually really great. And um, uh, there's a 2020 uh, co-authored piece that you have. Um, where you frame it as this um, this pendulum that's swinging between sort of co collector professional relationships, and that um, it kind of goes sort of between support and condemnation, basically. And 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 so, can you maybe explain for the listeners what sort of the history is and the like, uh, like why? So apart from sort of the ethical challenges and and uh, the issues with like, looters in particular, um, you guys uh, kind of do a historical. Uh, uh, where did collectors come from? I guess mm -hmm. uh, in uh, when it, when we think about them, sort of, is the in the history of the discipline. Well, I guess you know the discipline started as as it, you know as antiquarianism, right? So before there ever was an archaeology, people, all people, have had this compulsion to collect stuff, and that goes for you know you, me, your grandmother, people in the past who you know will find artifacts from prior cultures with them this is just something that seems to be pan-human. And so archaeology, I think, itself was born out of that desire to to collect stuff and to learn about the stuff, and but to think about people through the stuff, right? That's what really separates us from antiquarians. So I think the history is really deep. And I, I do think that archaeologists are quite culpable in this whole sort of pendulum swing. We forget that that's how we started. We forget that we share that value with other people out there, almost everybody else out there. We forget that in a lot of ways, you know, we and collectors are the bad guys in a very real way. When you think about the perspectives of indigenous people in the Western hemisphere, whose ancestors actually made the stuff, none of us, you know, have the right to that material at all from that vantage point. So it's a really complicated, I think, landscape. It's a really it's a really, imp but it's a really important one. Ultimately, I think that getting all of those vantages into an understanding of what it, of what artifacts are and what archaeology is, is really important. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. And, and so we've, we've talked a little bit about, and, and I just want to say, I, I really loved your point about, um, about when you're working on, particularly on early material, how important it is to work with, um, with avocations. We were just recently talking about, um, collaborations these um fluted point survey projects right where there's where yeah. there's all sorts of um you know they gis points on on a map in a particular state that'll be the the fluted point survey and they're virtually all um avocational and and so so i think we, we we're getting this sense of just why this work is so important that you're doing or that work with um, collectors um is important but what are some of the biggest challenges to positive professional um avocational um relations you alluded that there's there was some pushback when you were in this uh, in these committees um and uh, and I'm just wondering if you could sort of elaborate on what some of those challenges are and then of course we'll sort of ask you to, to follow up on how we can address them <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think the pushback can come from all of those different sort of sectors that I just identified. So fellow archaeologists, sometimes less, much less often than it's, it's the same case as it always is, where there's a few people who are the that feel very strongly about something and they tend to make it seem like it's a much more um, sort of out there and accepted view. And what we saw in the data was that these are mostly SAA members and, and nearly all of them really support this kind of collaboration and recognize that it's that it's certainly better than the alternative. So nonetheless, some pushback comes from archaeologists themselves who, who feel, at least in this moment or that moment, that it's not an appropriate thing to do. 
Um, but there are there's also pushback from a lot of people in the collector community who have had bad experiences with archaeologists. Um, and I've seen it. I mean, I have watched archaeologists be just monstrous jackasses, too. I don't know if you can say that in a podcast, but just jerks. <laughs> yeah. I would have said worse. I was trying to censor. But, <laughs> you know, I they just really we can be an elitist bunch of jerks. And so I can see where um with the experiences that they've had, they would not want to have anything to do with us. So I, I oftentimes, uh, in, you know, in trying to establish a relationship with someone would have to overcome some other archaeologists, really bad negative interactions. There's some horror stories out there and I believe them. Uh, and then push back as well, rightfully so from, as I said, indigenous communities that don't feel like collectors or archaeologists who are settler colonialists should have this material at all. And I find it difficult to argue that point. Yeah. Yeah, some of the collectors that I've worked with um, uh, have have kind of expressed that not so much the concern with archaeologists themselves, but the loss of access to particular things. So like um, they're able to they're interested in this material, they're interested in learning about where it's from. Um, it kind of gives them like uh, uh, one of the women I work with, actually, she has kind of an interesting perspective on that. Uh, all of the objects in her collection come from the point of land that she lives in. And she said, I think it'd be problematic to remove them from this place because this is where they've always been. And this is where like this is where I found them. And I don't think it would be the most responsible thing for me to hand this over to somebody and it end up on a, in a banker's box on a shelf somewhere. Right. Like, you know, I'm happy to show it to you and show it to anybody who wants to see the collection. And so it's a sort of interesting tension kind of ties in with like connection to places and, and, you know, how, how these places transcend, you know, pre-contact and, and contemporary attachments and, and, you know um, uh, but yeah, it's, it, it, you know, it kind of centers around a bunch of, of challenging issues in that way. Yeah, yeah, it really does, you know, but I, I will maintain that the best case scenarios are when there are more voices at the table and that you wrangle through the issues together and you get to that deeper understanding, you you figure out together a better way of stewarding the material, but archaeologists have to be willing to let go of the idea that we know best, that, that our Western museums are the places this stuff belongs. That's offensive to collectors in a lot of cases, like the one you just mentioned, Ken, that's a great example, and it can be offensive to Indigenous people, right? So yep. there's just so many it makes it really an interesting anthropological problem. And I like, you know, these days I'm doing more engagement with it from an anthropological perspective than from sort of as an archaeologist. I'm not doing the same kinds of like fluted point surveys that I did in my, my early years of trying to sort of wrangle with the actual record of early people in the mountains. I'm much more interested in the in the human relationships with the artifacts belongings That's, right i mean even yeah. that even that language is is changing and i not think not changing fast enough but certainly if you look in some bodies of literature that term belongings is preferred now in archaeological literature to artifacts to exactly to signal that these mean a lot of things to a lot of different people That's such an interesting point and such a good collect uh, connection to some of the to some of the topics that we want to ask you about too and and so but i got the sense that, that what you maybe just gave us was sort of the first half of your when when your master's student comes to you and says um i'm working on this project you know maybe i'm i'm working on you know a fluid point project or, or some project or coastal erosion some project where it's absolutely essential to work with collectors and um so obviously, so I guess uh, part of what what Ken and I would would like to ask is 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 how what's the best way to avoid being a jackass, as you pointed <laughs> out, so, and, to, and to work on getting these more more of these voices um, at the table. How do you sort of counsel your students to approach um, getting started in these areas? You know, I, I counsel my students, and I try to counsel my unwilling colleagues in exactly the same way, and that is <laughs> humility. You know, just approach it. it approach these situations like a normal person. Don't approach it like, you you know, you. we get so much pressure to be fair to archaeologists that we have to know everything. We're supposed to be the expert in the room. We can just let go of that and, you know, it, enjoy a journey of learning together. And when I, I find that when I do that, when I'm successful in doing that, and I'm not always, I can be an elitist asshole too. Oh, that one's probably really bad. I can be elitist. I, sorry. I can be very elitist with the rest of them, but I try really hard to keep that in check. I try to remember that the reality 
reality is there are truly different ways of understanding anything, anytime. I think that's something that as maybe as you get older, you either lean into that and you find comfort with it or else you just get entrenched and you're like, no, I'm going to keep doing everything the same way. For me, there's been a real shift in how I think about everything I do. And so I counsel my students, yeah, be you don't know everything, know that going in and know that that everything is richer and it's more fun when you work collaboratively with people and the more people, the better. So get rid of that old idea about group work being bad, group work, not bad, group work, good. <laughs> yeah, uh, so we're we're all about the point uh, We we are trying to really drive home the fact uh, on this podcast that archaeology is actually very fun. And so I, I love that addition yeah. of, you know, you going out and talking to people, it is it is really fun. And it's, it's interesting to hear you talk about that, too, the about humility the i've been on a, a nearly decade long coastal survey in maine um in which i've identified exactly zero new sites the only sites we've added to the inventory have been from uh, responsible collectors yep. um you know and, and to the point that you know probably 10 years ago what i should have done is hung out at the marine hardware store and talked to people rather than actually go out and test models which is which has proven <laughs> horribly ineffective <laughs> but so that's a that's a good point i think um, um so you, you talked about um, uh, getting a wide variety of voices at the table and just kind of wind back to what we were talking about earlier. And I was, I was actually kind of curious. So, um, you know, you talked at the start about the differences in regulation and legislation and how that kind of affects the, how, how it affected the shaping of the statement that you guys put forward. Um, and, and we're a New Brunswick based podcast. Uh, but, and so I was curious um, how much CanCon there was uh, on the task force, the Canadian content, I guess, and, and contribution to the task force and whether or not um, that had any effect on sort of the, the final version of the statement and, and how the SAA has sort of grappled with like the very different ways that archaeological regulation is applied um, in the United States, where you've got this sort of formalized section 106 uh, top down kind of like you've got a lot of a lot more robust heritage legislation, as well as a federal heritage law, which we don't have in Canada. Um, uh, and how how you guys navigated that and, and you know, whether there was input that um, from Canadian archaeologists that maybe shifted some of the terminology or, or your guys thinking. Well, so that was 2015, and I am forgetting now who uh, I, I should have like looked at my own task force report before we started this. And so I don't recall exactly who we had, but I know that we were very cognizant of the difference in laws in various places. So there was certainly representatives from places that we knew collecting was illegal. So if it wasn't in, in a Canadian space, it was from south of the border, where that's also true in places like Peru, for example. Yeah. So um, that was we we were we realized that was important. We realized we really had to be sort of least common denominator in any recommendations that we made. And we we had to be upfront that it, you know, kind of first and foremost, there's like a flow chart. If something is illegal in your country or in your space, you shouldn't be doing it, you know, period, kind of end of story. I would never recommend someone do, even though I believe that this is by and large an ethical approach, I would not recommend anyone, including my students or anybody else's students or myself, go do this if the law says that you should not be doing it. That's just never a good idea. So I'm sorry that I can't remember it. I'm giving away my advanced age and, and lack <laughs> of nimble all. memory. Not at all. No, no. It, I, we we didn't need. Uh, I I wasn't uh, I didn't wasn't trying to fish your your memory on that. Uh, just I was just curious if like if if anything came up because I know that you know like one of the things that I'm kind of interested in is that you know there there is in a more sort of practical way how we effectively kind of navigate this balance between regulating and over-regulating mm -hmm. um, avocational activities and how, you know, you can have this, you want to have legislation that, that's robust and protects archaeological and cultural resources, but you don't want to sort of push people away by making it so prescriptive and so aggressive um, that you, you, you basically push people into hiding. And, and like that, I'm, I'm kind of interested in seeing that because I feel like some of what we what I deal with working in New Brunswick is kind of working in this sort of awkward gray area where I'm engaging with locals and with collectors and with private citizens, but I'm aware that what they're doing is in a very in a technical sense illegal, right? And how how to communicate the results of the work that I'm doing with them, right? Like, um, and and so this is you know one of these challenges, right? And so so do you do you get a sense of like what the do you have a sense of like what the balanced approach is? Like, have you seen kind of a regulatory framework? Maybe it's how Oklahoma approaches archaeology. I don't know, but like, is there, is there sort of a perfect way to 
um, to see legislation crafted. Uh, or I think that, even uh, if I could just follow up on, on Ken's question, maybe with like an action thing, is there a thing archaeologists should be lobbying for sort of? Like, yeah, that yeah. You could think what like, some key reforms would be. That's a really great question. I'm I'm thinking about the answer to that. I, I, I don't know. I mean, so many, there have been so many efforts, sort of discrete efforts to do this in everyone has slightly different circumstances. So I'm thinking about, um, I'm thinking about the European situation, but even there, you've got a ton of diversity. So thinking about the UK, you know, they had, they tried, experimented with their STOP Act, I think it was called, that was a big, a really harsh prescription against any metal detecting, and that couldn't have backfired worse. Completely mm-hmm. disastrous approach to to the entire situation. But on the flip side, the portable antiquity scheme, I think, is a really good model for how this can work. Now, that's that's a place where the what's being collected there is all assuming is done legally as well. So that doesn't exactly get around the question you're asking. And I've had to to face that as well because. It's one thing to to write a statement that SAA can get behind as an organization that represents everyone. There's no doubt we had to put that language about legality in there. On the other side of that, there are plenty of places, including in Peru, despite what some Peruvian archaeologists would say, and in Mexico, which is another example of a place where it's just do not do it, right? You're going to get in big trouble with Ina. There are still collectors who are collecting in a way that we would consider to be responsible, and they have so much information. There are looters, certainly, you know, that fall into that other class, and and I know lots of archaeologists who work with them. For me, the fe- the equivalent would be our federal land and a lot of state lands in the in the U.S. That is illegal. It's legal to collect on on your own land, on private land, if you have permission, but it's not legal in, on federal land. And I have worked with collectors who typically, if they have like their entire collection is from public land. That's probably not someone I'm going to engage with because practically speaking, I'm not going to be able to publish it. And no, no right. journal is going to want to publish that. But, you know, more often it's someone has a, is, is a collector because they live on a big parcel of, of ranch land or farmland. And they're for generations, that's what their family has done. So they have all these materials. That same person might have a, you know, an object or two or three or four, or just a, a minimal number from, um, federal land where they went fishing routinely, right? That makes it into the collection. And so I certainly don't go, "Ah!" you know, there's a few of these that are, that are from federal property that, that gets, that does no good for anybody, you know? So instead what, what I try to do is build a relationship that is a long-term relationship with people. And then I like to involve people because most of them want to be involved. That's why they're sharing. Most collectors, you know, are so thrilled when I want to go look at a site that they found and When I involve them in the process of recording the site, for example, and they have to reconstruct for themselves where something came from and then have the realization, oh, I don't know where it came from. Those that kind of teaching, you know, we're supposed to be good at teaching. That's I'm a professor. It's what I do. And so I try to kind of bring that model to the situation and then allow people some space to learn on their own. That for me works way better than this is what the law says. That just that you sound like the Charlie Brown parents. Like, rah, 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 rah. Nobody's <laughs> yeah. going to listen to that. Nobody wants to be lectured at like that, including archaeologists. So, you know, again, that humility and approaching people the way you'd want to be approached, they will, in many cases, come around and maybe donate the collection. I've had that happen um, and and certainly stop the collecting activity. So if you really want to have an impact, you don't put your head in the sand. That never works. You put, you know, your head to the, to the your nose to the groundstone. And you teach and you do it in a gentle way that has some humility. I'm guessing that that the ranchers you work with in Oklahoma, their hats are so big, they wouldn't be able to put their heads in the ground. Like, I'm imagining that. <laughs> I, what little I know about ranching in Oklahoma, it, it seems like I, I, I guess you, you see some fantastic hats. In, but I think that that's such an important point. And I think one of the the things that, that your work helped um, people help aware about is that that maybe as archaeologists, one of the things we need to be doing is creating more opportunities for folks that are interested in archaeology, but not as a career, but who are. Um, and and I was wondering, you, you mentioned one, I think, sort of important thing, which is that when you're working with um, a collector on that collector's um, material, um, to include them in the in the data collection process and the data recording process. So I think that's, that would be one point. But I'm wondering if there are, there are kind of other um, suggestions you might have, um, whether uh, at a at a group level for including the public in a way that facilitates some of these relationships. Yeah, you know, 
if I'm interested in a new place, the way I've always started is by, I like to marshal students because students have relationships in the communities of interest, right? And they, they can get places that I never could. And so, because they can tap their grandma or grandpa and, you know, and we can start in a community. And I, when I, when I do this, I try to do it in a kind of a splashy way. Like there's a, a really nice benefit because people are doing a valuable service, there should be some reciprocity. And so I try to, um, in some, in some cases, when I was trying to do this in Utah, when I was at Utah State University prior to coming to OU, um, I, I set out and, and did a number of road shows. I called them artifact road shows. And I know many people do this and we would make sure that the press knew about this. And there was some, some pictures and it would be family events. We'd bring barbecue stuff. And so that people would would know this is cool, they could come, their picture might be in the paper, and we'd do it multiple times. And what I was trying to do is to create an atmosphere where people want to be part of it, rather than like, you know, having to, so that they would come to me rather than, and that's, that works, you know, if people see that there's something in it for them, that it's fun, that there are people that will be respectful of them that want to know what they know, they will, they will do the work, they will come to you, and you don't have to, to fight that, that battle anymore. Yeah, that's you know, there's a lot more comfort engaging with people who you might not be regularly comfortable with, like sort of that, you know, that sort of spooky ivory tower, archae- you know, university people coming in, right, that uh, that they're always there to observe you as opposed to be part of the community. Yeah. Yep. Are there, um, are archaeological societies a big thing um, out West as well? Yes, they are. And and oftentimes those are places that'll have like, uh, that's a great place to start. They, there will be, you know, every state is different. Oklahoma has an interesting history of having um, very expressly expelled all of their collectors into their own little organization. And they, so the OAS, the Oklahoma Anthropological Society now is, is sort of as, as gatekeepy as any um as any archaeologist that I know in terms of really keeping those collectors at bay. I don't think that's a healthy thing in Oklahoma, and I haven't seen it in other places I've worked like Utah or Colorado, where um, there's more room in that tent and more of that sort of ethic of education, you know, let people be part of the group and see why we do things differently as archaeologists and why it can be just as rewarding and fun, just with different currencies. Is is that sort of where the like the idea for the Oklahoma Public Archaeology Network came from, came out of? And and do you want to speak about uh, uh, OKPAN to, a little bit? Sure. So, so OKPAN is about, I guess, six years old now. Um, and yes, I, when I took the position at the University of Oklahoma, it was, it was advertised in this phenomenally interesting way to me. They wanted someone who focused on the earliest cultures in the Americas, ideally someplace in the vicinity of Oklahoma, so not too far afield, but they also wanted, and this was the intriguing part, someone who would come heal the relationship between archaeologists and avocationals in the state. Oh, that wow. was pretty, yeah, I can't remember the phrasing and I can't find the job ad to save my life. I save everything, but I can't find that. But it was something like that that got my attention. And they kept calling me because there's not that many people that do it. So it, you know, it's just <laughs> one of those things. But um, I got to Oklahoma and the first thing I wanted to do was to make sure that that there really was such a schism. I don't like to take things, you know, at face value. And so I had a, a student that did an ethnographic study of the avocational community and professionals and learned that, yes, indeed, there is this big schism. But as we then tried to move forward and co-create with the organization what a solution might look like, it became really clear that they kind of had, they needed to, to kind of make some decisions as an organization and that trying to make this kind of change, you know, by coming in sort of as an imperialist and just imposing it, that's not going to work. And so I decided to step back and then in in partnership with some graduate students of mine who are just really brilliant people, we envisioned what, what what we could do in a state like Oklahoma, where we have so many constituents who care about the past in distinctly different ways. And we really, you know, I'm a firm believer and long have been in the value of public archaeology and of, of education and of, you know, letting people talk, enabling, facilitating conversations, difficult conversations across boundaries, population boundaries. I believe that's the only way, you know, to help any situation, including sort of our polarization 
um, that we're all experiencing these days that is so it sort of accelerated in the last five to 10 years. I, I really think that heritage, I think of it as harmony through heritage. That's actually a chat GPT like phrase that it came up with and I loved it. <laughs> it's but good. I, it's, uh... I know, like, thank you, AI. That's awesome. You know, I just think it sort of expresses what I, what I want to do with the remaining days that I have on earth, which is to use my, you know, my particular form of expertise, which is just one for understanding heritage and bridge it with all of the other ways of knowing that are out there and to create conversations among people today. That's what I, when I say I'm more anthropologically focused, that's kind of what I mean. Um, that's where I want my energy to go. That can trickle into the classroom because I don't know about New Brunswick, but at least here in all of the United States, we're still not 50 years after you know, sort of educational archaeology was a thing. We're still not doing it. We're still not introducing kids to archaeology until they get to college. Then we've got to find them, convince them that this is a thing, that there's real jobs to be had. And it's really, it's silly. We, we should be doing this in school because, yeah, for a whole lot of reasons. So I'll get off my soapbox there. I'm, I'm getting, yeah. No, no, that, no uh, uh, you could keep going. That's, uh, you're sort of <laughs> speaking, speaking our language, basically. Yeah. That's, uh, that's, exa <laughs> that's exactly why you, in we invited you here actually is because yeah. of this sort of thing. And, 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 you know, and, and really like why we kind of wanted to start doing this podcast basically, right. Was that there's a kind of a vacuum of public engagement and public education in archeology span in New Brunswick. We actually don't even have a functioning uh, archaeological society. Mm. Um, and I'm, I'm out here in Alberta now, and I've been just blown away by how, um, uh, how effective the Alberta archaeological society has been at engaging with the public and with collectors and with like just people. So, you know, like they're, we, 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 our co-founders of the professional association in New Brunswick, which has become sort of the de facto, a body of of public engagement and and I think we can we can boast maybe having 25 people come to one meeting one time and and uh, and that would be the bare minimum for any of our meetings here it, just in the Lethbridge center of of the uh, Alberta Arc Society like so and and kind of it sounds like the Ocpan is doing the same thing that you guys are sort of building from the ground up and and engaging everybody and kind of taking down those barriers between um the various different forms of engagement with heritage in the past, right? Yeah, that's, that's exactly it. You know, and it's, it's very much a, it's a, it's also, Oak Pen's also sort of a laboratory for students. What I try to do is I have this nice endowment because of that fancy name that you read off on, my, <laughs> you know, attached to my, to my title. Um, there's a lot of money there and I feel like I have a, a choice. I can either sort of perpetuate the structures that are not helpful that I think a lot of us in 2023 are realizing have not been helpful. Ivory tower business, you know, churning out a homogenized archeological population, all of that stuff. And I think that I've always thought students are, students are the future. They're the key to, to making change. It's not to try to educate the old people. They're not going you know, some of them will change, but a lot of them are not going to change. So that's where the energy goes. And I start with the college population because I can take that money and I can encourage them to think in their super creative, pliable way that they do about how we can bridge, you know, other communities that we're not yet bridging. What can we experiment with? And I can fund them, you know, help them get their education, but then also have this impact that kind of trickles out through the community. So the more communities that someone can serve. I, I like to challenge them to double dip, triple dip, quadruple dip. How many can we can we serve with one effort in one way or another? And it's really, it's really fun. So we don't, we're not doing stuff like anybody else. We kind of stole our name. We didn't steal it. We told them we were going to do it, but FPAN is the Florida Public Archaeology mm -hmm. Network. And they are, you know, they are a very different animal, but I love that they're I love their acronym. So, so that's the only thing we share in common, except for we get together and we have pancakes in honor of the fact that we're both pans. <laughs> that's awesome. And we're both, we all, we also both feel like every state and maybe every province should have a pan. So yeah, maybe, you, I don't know what it would be like New Brunswick pan. That doesn't, and NB pan. I don't know what it would NB be pan. for you guys, but yeah. I do feel like we're onto something that could work. It, that's very transferable and could work other places. So that's, you know, another thing I would like to do now that we've sort of figured ourselves out, we've created something that I think is valuable to the various communities. I'd like to kind of get the word out about how others might be able to use some of our programming, even if you don't have a ton of money, because it's not that much money to, to run a big organization. I mean, FPAN, there are 
line item in their legislature and they get millions of dollars and have, you know, offices and professionals all over Florida. So it's a totally different animal, but we're still having a really big impact in the kinds of programs that we do. That's great. Yeah, I'm, I'm involved yeah. with the CAA, uh, the Canadian Archaeological Association. CanPan is a nice, uh, has a nice there name, it. doesn't it? Uh, that uh, does. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, we want to be mindful of your time here, Dr. Pimpleto. We really appreciate you you coming on. And I think one of the things that that I'm excited about about this conversation was that that you've you've left us with a lot of of aspirational goals. I think here, which is which is also one of our goals on the podcast. So we like to. To, to sort of try to leave the listener with hopefully exciting next and collaborative um, collaborative steps. Was there anything uh, you want to follow up with, Ken? Or? Uh, no, I actually, well, I guess we should turn it over to you. Do you have any, um, was there anything that you want to highlight in particular in the work that you're doing or is it a particular project or um, uh, a piece that you'd want to want to kind of pitch that we haven't asked you about? Um, uh, or do you have any questions for us, I guess, about uh, about how things are going? I, I mean, I like Gabe said, this is sort of it's great. Like a, a, it's nice to end on a kind of a this high note about, you know, how how well Ockpan is is kind of working. And and uh, I mean, I, my takeaway is that we need to find a um, uh, we need to find a, an endowment for New Brunswick archaeology. Really, Gabe, that's the that's the that's the next thing. Right. Yeah, There's yeah. other ways, though. I had <laughs> when I listen to me, fellas, when I when I first took my my job at Utah State University, which was the other job I had for a substantial period of time. I was there for 10 years prior to coming to OU. I stepped into a museum directorship. I, I was the director of their Museum of Anthropology, and they gave me zero staff and zero budget. And I had to build oh, wow. all of that from scratch. It's why I got good at, at making something out of nothing. And, and the, what I've realized is that especially universities, we have so many resources, intangible resources. So it's more about being clever and creative um, than it is about the money. It's just not, I don't have that much money to do, to do the kinds of things we're doing. It's because we have the human capital and then just the equipment and things that we can access on a university campus. So I think that's why I think this is, is transferable. And the other thing is, you, you know, it doesn't have to be endowment level, you know, deans and, and provosts, they like to say they don't have money. They do have money. They do have money and they can be, <laughs> they have interests too. So the key there, again, it's always about looking for convergent interests. What is it that they need? How can you you get what you need while they get what they need. And so I've found really good buy-in from our college level, for example, right. um, the dean's level into the kinds of programs we're doing. So, you know, it's, you know, yes, money is wonderful. And I think money, this is one of those things money follows. You know, a lot of the people who do collect happen to have a lot of money. Maybe if you're nice to them, you know, which I have found, they will give it. You know, the work I did in Utah was absolutely supported by someone who was an artifact collector. That's so, interesting. Yeah. yeah, that is interesting. Yeah, that's yeah. great. Um, it continues to be inspirational to us for the for thinking about about ways to to move this work forward. Yeah, as somebody who's pre tenured, this is all like I'm I'm jotting I'm going to be re listening and jotting down notes. You know, the, the... <laughs> I'm right here. You can contact me anytime, and I would be yeah. glad to help. I it Can really harmony... like. Go ahead. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I, I I cut out from it in the cup. I I was just going to say harmony through heritage should be written on the top of your pad. I think. Ken. I, I think the, so. Yeah. No, I've yeah. got it circled actually on my on my sheet of paper right here. That's yes. uh, <laughs> that's <laughs> probably that the episode good? title right there. I think. That's I think the, it is. Uh, <laughs> that's yeah. good. That's really good. Actually, that's yeah. a good. Yeah, you use it that way. That's great. Yeah. We'll put the we'll put the TM afterwards though to make sure that uh, uh, there you go. <laughs> Even yes. if it's not true. <laughs> um, the one other thing I did want to just share is that what I'm doing now um, is is working with some colleagues globally. We're so we're really trying to wrangle with this issue of sort of uh, what objects mean to different constituencies at not just the U.S. level or the the Western Hemisphere level, but all over the world. And so. I'm not sure exactly how this project will evolve, but I have partners in um, one of whom has worked extensively in the UK, one's in Belgium, one's in Norway, which is a really interesting place. And all of them have artifact collectors just like we do everywhere on earth does. And so we're all sort of thinking of ways that we can work ethnographically with those different populations, those different demographics that we talked about before, the archaeologists, the collectors, but also indigenous people, not just in the Western Hemisphere, but Norway, for instance, has the Sami. So what do they think about objects? And, and are those relationships in what way similar? All, all of it with the goal of, again, identifying ways where there are convergences. 
that where there are harmonies, you know, if we're going to go back to our harmonies thing, because I really think that archaeology could use a reconceptualization, a re-theorization of what artifacts are so that it, it does become something, the terminology even changes to be something more systematically like belongings, which is what they yeah. really, really are. So yeah. that's what yeah. I'm, that's the sort of the current direction I'm taking this stuff. That's that sounds like a sounds like a fun direction actually. That's <laughs> um, and I think uh, I I think that uh, Gabe, do you have anything else to to add at this point? No, I was just going to thank Dr. Pavlita for coming on because we we really appreciate this perspective on this work, and I I think it's just incredibly interesting and also um, incredibly important. And um, it was it's nice to meet you in person because as I said, I was engaged with them. Um, a lot of your stuff when we were working on that Eastern States Archaeology Federation uh, meeting thing. So thank you very much. You you yeah. had done um, such a exhaustive um, work on it, and especially the stuff you guys published in advance in archaeological practice was so useful um, yeah. for us. So so thanks very much. And I think and that our listeners will get just as much out of um, this conversation, um, but they should also check out your work, which we're going to put in the show notes, so they'll be able to to find that. Yeah, awesome. and same and same here. It's uh, uh the 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 2022 uh, issue as well as the sort of formulation of the of the task force is is one of a group of readings for my cultural resource management class. So, nice. um, so that's a thank you for that. And 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 the other thing I think that's great about this is that you're doing work and publishing work on public archaeology. And lo and behold, the public can actually read this stuff because it's open access. So yes. that's a, <laughs> that it's a, from, from tooth to tail. It's actually like, you know, you're it's, it's done the right way. So um, yeah. Thank you again for making time for us, uh, Bonnie. And, and, um, uh, and we'd love to have you back on again at some point too, at, uh, you know, just to, I don't know, get highlights from this, uh, the, the object constituencies work. That's uh, that sounds like, uh, sounds like lots of fun. So. Well, it's been an honor to be here, and I really appreciate the the chance to share with everybody. So thank you for asking. Thank you Thanks so again. much. Bye now. So, Ken, that was a good conversation uh, with Dr. Pipleto. Yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, uh, fascinating uh, to talk to her about this stuff, and uh, it'll be interesting to see how um, some of the themes she picked up on uh, um, in her work are things that we pick up with Dave here in a couple of weeks. Yeah, I think so too. And um I, I think it's it's really great. There's been a couple of, of uh themes that we've sort of been chasing out this season, I think. Um and but but obviously just one of them is about all of the contributions I think the public are making to um archaeological research, especially um and Dr. Pipleto made this case, I thought, really, really well. Um and it was something I'd never really thought about, which is how essential the including the public uh in the most difficult archaeological problems is, yeah, uh, you know, so um, that means coastal erosion. It means, um, you know, very uh, low visibility uh, archaeological sites that that we're just not going to find because we can't test the whole universe at two and a half meter intervals. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, uh, you know, uh, it's 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 interesting too to see the perspective of somebody who's doing sort of early peopling research, um, and yes. how you know integral even in even in a stable environment, uh, um, how integral the public is to accessing that archaeological record. Yeah, that's exactly right. But I think uh, Ken, if I can quote the uh, the great Ian Drury here, uh, hit me. I think it's uh, hit piece time. I think it is hit piece time. Yeah. <laughs> This uh, this week, um, you uh, you found this uh, this podcast uh, from CBC Ideas. Uh, yeah, actually, and... my my mother found this podcast and sent it to me and said this might be of interest to you. Oh, fantastic! She she was absolutely right, and it uh, it would probably be of interest to uh, our listeners as well because it actually included an interview with um, Steph Homhofer. Yeah, yeah. So I listened to the podcast. So it's the CBC Ideas podcast, and the title is Atlantis and the Apocalypse, The World of Fringe Archaeology. Um, so the podcast is out now. And what I actually hadn't realized is this is an episode of Ideas. The original episode aired back in February of 2023. Oh, okay. um, but the podcast just came out a couple of weeks ago. And so um, uh, basically, they uh, uh, they Stephanie is one of the, the experts that they talk to um, about sort of the context of ancient apocalypse coming out um, and how some of the pseudo archaeology that has fed into that and some of the background about um, 
uh, Graham Hancock himself and um, sort of how his ideas have been used and how they were formulated and how he sort of built this story over the last, I don't know, like 25 years or something like that. Um, dating back to, I can't remember what the title of his original book was, um, Hand um, of the God I, or something. Uh, is, is it because Chariots of the God is the second one? I can't remember either, but the one of the things actually that I thought the, the podcast, uh, did really interestingly was connect, um, yeah, you know, they sort of go around and they find like what kind of bookstores are likely to carry, say, a, a Graham Hancock book. And it turns out it uh, it really runs the gamut from uh, kind of new age bookstores, you know, in in the kinds of neighborhoods that people associate with British Columbia and uh, also alt right uh, bookstores. So um, kind of yeah, tracking yeah. the intellectual history of of uh, of these books. And it actually talks to a, uh, a kind of ex conspiracy theorist about uh the allure of uh of graham hancock and his fellow travelers yeah yeah and how and it was interesting too that his experience the way he described um described it, it was like somebody who had left a cult basically right like yeah. you know that they had to get out of this right um and it was interesting too i i, I liked how the host um or the voiceover guy uh leaned into that yeah. uh, uh how how um um uh, Daryl had kind of been able to mime that uh, that uh, could it be voice yeah, yeah. like the the uh, and how the host on the podcast actually leaned into that as well that you know that this is sort of a, a trope actually of this particular type of media. That's right, because it uh, that you never hear the voice saying no, it couldn't. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and then uh, I think our uh, our other hit piece, and of course we'll drop these all in the in the show notes. Is we may have mentioned this already, but uh, you know it's uh, it's our podcast, so I like to do a little shameless self promotion here, which is that the uh, embedding librarians and archaeological field schools uh, by me, Arthur Anderson, and two of our UNB librarians, Eric Moore and Mike Mead is um is finally out that's available uh open access through advances in archaeological practice um and so if you if you go to the advances in archaeological practice website you can download this one of the great advantages of working with librarians is they are aware of when your university has negotiated uh free open access with particular journals and know what boxes to check but basically uh the premise uh for this paper was that there aren't a whole lot of experiences that we can be certain pretty much every professional archaeologist is going to do. One of them is the archaeological field school. And so once you have that realization, you have to start thinking about from a kind of pedagogical uh, perspective. I can't believe I just used that word um, from a uh, from a teaching perspective. The listener can't see this, but when, when Ken hears pedagogical, he unclips the safety on his revolver. Um, and uh but anyway, and and so you know, one of the themes. So we we try to put stuff in the field school that we think everyone should know. And one of these things is just that we are really looking at uh, one way to phrase it would be a data crisis. Another would be a data opportunity uh, in in archaeology, where we're we're generating all sorts of digital data. We've got to manage it, and we've got to think about how we're going to use it um, both as researchers, but also to disseminate it, right? Um, and so yeah. that's why we we bring archaeologists in the field with us. And also, um, you know, it helps. You, you bring uh, librarians in the field with you. What did I, did I say? Archaeologists? You did. Yeah. yeah, yeah Remember yeah. how you, 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 the first time you sent me this paper, you told me it was called embedding, embedding archaeologists <laughs> in, in archaeological field schools. <laughs> yeah, no, it's pretty confusing. Uh, the, uh. <laughs> Ken, we we upstream and downstream synergies so quickly over here that sometimes yeah, I think... you just get caught in the eddies. Yeah, you 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 called it a um, an opportunity, and and to paraphrase uh, uh, one of my former bosses, uh, it's it's uh, sometimes this data can be a cluster opportunity. Actually, yeah. That's, uh, yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So anyway, um, check it out. Share it with your librarian. Uh, tell your uh, your librarian to. Um... Uh, share it with their dean and try to shake the money tree to get some uh, some support for them. Um, but I should also say, uh, if you're in, uh, if you're going to the SA, are you going to the SAAs this year, Ken? Uh, I don't think so. Yeah, I don't but... think I am either. But if you are going to the SAAs, listener, um, Eric Moore uh, is going to be presenting a poster on some of this work um, at the Society for American Archaeology meeting uh, in New Orleans. Yeah, and you can you can see that there. Maybe we'll um, uh, after the conference. Maybe he'd be willing to share a poster yeah. for us to link to or something. That'd be a great idea. We might even want to get him on just to talk a little bit about this. Yeah, yeah, that'd uh, be great. 
Yeah, but yeah, that's right. If you see him, bring him a Sazerac and a Po' Boy and uh, tell him you heard about him here first. can't see this but ken is uh is uh he looks like a um a nervous air traffic controller something has gone wrong with his headset but i think uh is it, are you back ken i'm back i'm back yep it was uh, it was almost uh almost a failed dongle oh wow the uh ken, ken actually wears a, a bandolier of dongles now when we do this so he can i believe it's called hot swapping he can hot swap the dongles exactly um, exactly the uh, well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Bonnie Pipolato, for being on this episode, and thank you, listener, for tuning in. Yep, thank you, listener, and we will see you in a fortnight, and we will continue the conversation about archaeologist collector relationships with friend of the show, David W. Blank. That's right. Talk to you soon. Bye, listener.